Hi there everybody, thank you so much for joining me today and allowing me to share with you my play journey. Um, I had a wee think about how I was going to start the presentation off and I think quite simply for me, play has changed my professional practice in a way that no other approach ever has in the 20 years that I've been teaching. It's forced me to reevaluate my teaching, learning and assessment processes and, and think more deeply about child development and why play quite simply is the best way for children to learn. So on the screen you'll see an outline um, of my presentation. I'm going to start with a little introduction of how I got to be here and um, presenting to you all today. Um, a little bit about the key features of playful pedagogy and how this helps me to achieve high quality learning and teaching and assessment that both motivates and engages every learner in my class. Furthermore, I'd like to show you how I've used the key messages of realising the ambition being me and shaping probably my most recent practice. And I hope then in listening to my presentation that you gain a better understanding of my classroom environment and what it makes, what it takes, sorry, to make it so successful and that you appreciate the role of the adult in making the approach so successful and that you get a flavour of perhaps what a day might be like in my classroom. So this is me, the best photo I could find. Um, I just thought it'd be nice to put a photo uh, to a name Obviously, presenting like this online, you know, you don't get a chance to see the presenter. So, um, a little bit about me. My name's Leanne Sweet and I am currently the primary one class teacher at Aberdour Primary School in Fife. And I have been in primary one for the last four years. I'm also acting principal teacher this year and I will be next year. Um, and part of my remit is to promote play beyond my primary one classroom and so far we've had a lot of success with that. In addition, I also work for Fife's Promoting Playful Pedagogy team um, and we strive to promote play across all primary one classrooms in Fife. So just to set the context, this is Aberdour Primary School. It's a small village school on the west coast of Fife. We've been on our play journey, as I say, for the last four years um, and probably a little bit before that, before I took up um, the class teacher of Primary 1. Uh, back in February 2020, which seems like a lifetime ago now, we were actually inspected by HMIE and we were given really high praise for our playful pedagogy approach, which I was really proud of. Ultimately, this inspection really changed things for me professionally. Um, external partners started to get in touch and wanted to find out a bit more about our approach because on the bottom of the inspection report, um, the playful pedagogy was highlighted as practice worth sharing. And then obviously I was asked to work then with the Promoting Playful Pedagogy team, like I said, in Fife and given a remit then to promote play with staff in my school and probably hence the reason why I'm here today talking to you as a pedagogy pioneer. So obviously, like I said in my previous slide, I was delighted to be recognised as having practice worth sharing in our inspection. And I thought I would just share with you the extract that um, HMI had to say about our playful pedagogy approach. I've highlighted in green um, the words that really stuck out to me, the ones that really showcase, you know, what makes our playful pedagogy so important and highlights the evidence that the inspectors saw during their visit. And then, of course, it was really reaffirming to me then when realising the ambition was released at the same time um, in February 2020 as we were being inspected because shortly after that, when I read that, I thought, yeah, I'm on the right path. My approach is what I'm um, ultimately realising the ambition is trying to achieve. And then, of course, um, at the start of this session, um, August 2020, amidst COVID and everything else that was going on, I was delighted to be approached then by Education Scotland um, because they wanted to produce a sketch note of our success and they were thrilled to hear that in spite of COVID, we were still keeping 
you know, playful pedagogy at the heart of our learning, teaching and assessment cycle, um, especially across the early level. Because as we will all know and do know that how vitally important um, the recovery and children's health and well-being is at this, at this critical moment in their education and play really helps to support them with that. So I thought I would start by hooking you all in now that I've had my introduction. I thought I would hook you all in with this photo and I just love looking at this photo because it brings back such a special memory for me and actually I picked it because it really shows the essence of the play-based approach and why it is so important. Um, the other reason I chose it is because this is something you would have never seen happen in my classroom just a few years back. I wouldn't have entertained the mess, quite frankly. <laughs> um, but my goodness, I have a memory of this day and these four boys will certainly remember this experience for a long time to come. And the reason why, quite simply, they'll remember this is because they led it. They led this piece of learning. So what was my role in this? Well, for a start, I, I allowed this to take place. I mean, there was paint, there was paper towels, there was water. It was a right guddle, but the boys had an idea in their mind of what they were trying to achieve. And I'm sure you can see that they were trying to create a volcano. Um, but as I observed and facilitated the activity and I listened to them and I questioned and I I recorded what I saw um, this one experience alone in maybe a half hour, 45 minute slot in my classroom hit so many experiences and outcomes, benchmarks. Um, and I wouldn't have ever seen that had I not been immersed in the playful pedagogy approach. I mean, in literacy alone, these boys were learning how to listen and talk to one another take turns when they were doing that, share their ideas, respond to each other's ideas in an appropriate way. They were recounting experiences with one another about volcanoes and what they knew and finding out best the vocabulary to use when sharing their ideas, thoughts and opinions with each other so that everybody understood the idea that they were trying to create. They furthermore engaged in the processes of the planet in science by investigating how water can change and move. And they also investigated the properties of different materials and justified their selection in terms of what paint they used, how they mixed the paint together, how they were using the paper towels, what happened when the paper towels didn't work as well as they should have done, and what happened to the water when they put the, the paint into it and so on. And then finally, there was a little bit of topical science because one of the children in this group actually loves volcanoes and they took the other children along for the ride. Not only were they leading their own learning, which is a key feature of playful pedagogy, but that child was also leading the learning of others too. I mean, how empowering for that child to be able to do that. Um, and what did I do? I simply had an area in my classroom with water and I had a painting area with paint and I allowed the children to use those things in the way that they wanted to. I just love that picture. So where did it all begin? It actually began with that quote in green there. Um, when I was announced as the primary one class teacher back in August 2017, my colleague who had already been teaching primary one um, previously said to me in part of her handover, well, um, just so you know, the children need to play more. So I was like, okay, this obviously flagged up a lot of questions for me. What does this mean? Who who said that? Why have they to play more? And, and when is this supposed to happen? And, and that's when I started to read everything and anything I could about play that I could find. I was struck by just how much literature that there was out there. I discovered that Scotland had a national play strategy set up in 2013 and then I heard about the Upstart campaign and trying to get more play back into the early years of primary and then 
I start to engage with the likes of Anne F. Grave and Greg Bottrell and Alistair Bryce Clegg and Tina Bruce and Julie Fisher, just to name a few. And then I also discovered that, you know, the argument for play isn't anything new. It actually dates back to well over a hundred years. Famous the theorists like Freud said it was therapeutic. Brunner said it was a rehearsal for life and Dewey a, a preparation for learning. It was quite incredible. And there you'll see a quote on realising the ambition. Um, a little bit about the transition between, obviously, the, in the early level between nursery and primary one, the transition will likely be smoother for the child of play remains and continues as the main vehicle for their early learning in primary one and beyond. So, we were going to play. <laughs> the minute you type play into a search engine, you are bombarded with the theory and the information about how, how important play really is for child development. This is where it really began to, or, or sorry, I really began to question my approach to teaching and learning in primary one and start to think about how I could incorporate more play into my day. If the quotes on this slide were true, then I wanted to see it in action. Um, you know, I started to think, what will, what will this do for my learners? How will I teach the curriculum? What, what do they play with? How long for? Where do they begin? I mean, the questions were endless. Nevertheless, I, I started with the environment in my classroom and I got rid of all my tables and chairs and things like that and started to set up play spaces because I needed those spaces um, to create the experiences and then obviously within those spaces and during those experiences is then the, the class teacher has these quality interactions. So I really began with um, my own nursery setting, which thankfully for me was right next door to my classroom. I spent time talking to the EYOs there about the spaces that they had set up and why they were there. And I asked them about the learning that they hoped the children would get from them, how often they changed them, when and why they did this is the you know things that have always there all the time. I got to learn more about you know Fife's core provision, and that really got me thinking about the spaces, and the experiences that I wanted to create for my own children in primary one, and what that progression would look like from nursery into primary one. One of the the key things that I've learned probably most recently in the last year or so, and this is through working with the Promoting Playful Pedagogy team, is that actually, you know, the physical environment is great and you can set that up, but actually the nurturing environment is key to the success of the physical environment. Um, and I didn't really appreciate that. I mean, in Aberdour where I work, you know, we are quite an affluent school. Our children come in ready to learn and um, and I know this isn't the case in other schools in Fife and obviously beyond Fife. So when this was flagged up to me, I thought, of course, you know, um, we have to get the nurturing environment correct first. And I think sometimes in a school where, where I work and the children come in so ready to learn and so able that the nurturing environment just happens automatically, but sometimes it's something that you really need to work at before the physical environment, as I say, would work well for you. And in realising the ambition being me, um, this quote that, you know, we often talk about the environment in terms of physical spaces, but actually the key part of the environment for the children is the human social environment of positive nurturing relationships and interactions. And I'm not just talking about the interactions between the adult and the child, it's also between the child and the child. So whilst the physical environment where it all takes place is really important, you know, realising the ambition reminds us that, you know, we have to first of all meet the needs of our learners. And, and two of the things that I've used um, over the past few years is, you know, on the left, Haslow's hierarchy of basic human needs. And then um, on the right there, um, Lu the Leuven scale of well-being and involvement. The Haslow's hierarchy is obviously indicative of what needs to come first and getting it right for our learners. And then the Leuven scale obviously allows us to see what's working well and perhaps what needs to change depending on our observations of the children's um, 
involvement with the environment that you've set up. But this is the beauty of the child-centred play-based classroom because it allows the class teacher to do just that. When the children are playing naturally, and they are natural play, you know, they play naturally because it's instinctive to them, you really get the opportunity to get to know your learners far more, I think, than a traditional primary one classroom. You, you notice more about them, you question them more, you know, the children instantly feel relaxed and happy because they're leading their own learning, they're getting to do what interests them, what motivates and engages them, and what they're curious about and things. And, you know, therefore, I think the nurturing relationships between the adults and the children and the children and the children happen naturally. And also because the children in particular between themselves in these play spaces and experiences, they really get to um, practice the skills of building good relationships over and over and over and over again, because they get to do it for such a long period of time over the day. So here in Fife, we promote the idea of learning zones, just thinking about the physical environment now. Spaces that allow for creativity, like your, your writing resources area, your art, your junk modelling. We also create spaces that allow for discovery and experiential learning, like construction, loose parts, the sand, water, science. And then social spaces too, like you know your book areas, your home corners, but in all these spaces, we weave our literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing and IDL throughout. However, I think it's important to note that in a playful pedagogy approach, you know, the teacher is still taking the lead in deciding what is on offer in the classroom and how that will best meet the needs of the children. I mean, but the zones, you know, these learning zones should reflect the learning and teaching that the class teacher hopes to achieve, but notably the learning is linked to the children's interests which come from the class teacher's observations. I mean, involving the children in planning and decision making is vital to the importance and the establishment of these zones. The children know what they want and they will share it with you and it's really empowering for them. Therefore, getting to know them as learners is key to creating a motivating and engagement and an engaging environment and, and this can only be achieved if we do observe and we assess what takes place in the spaces that we provide. I read somewhere that every month of the school year, primary teachers will have spent more than 100 hours with their children just in one month. So the observations and assessments that take place during this time really help us to plan the learning environment so that it meets the needs of all children. And if you look there at that quote from Realising the Ambition, it says, you know, the learning environment in the early stages of primary school should not look or feel starkly different from a motivating nursery environment, except that the level of provocation, so the things that the class teacher puts out, um, should be greater. The interactions that the class teacher has with the children or the adult has with the children in those spaces will be likely to be more challenging and that the experiences on offer, you know, might be slightly different, but the school environment should be conducive where children learn through play. So like me, um, a few years back, you're probably thinking, well, okay, that sounds great, but how do we cover everything that we need to teach and how what can be taught through play and what can't be taught through play? How do you track and monitor the progress? You know, and the answer quite simply is that what I've needed to do is really upskill myself in knowing how to observe children during play, knowing how to use high quality questioning um, to draw out of the children what, or discover what they are doing during that play. And then that really helps for me then to assess what the children are learning through that play experience and having robust recording methods, which give you the data that you need to justify why play is working for your learners. On the left hand side there, I've tried to you know list all the things that I think the adult or the class teacher's role is in a playful pedagogy approach. And um, you know, the realizing the ambition reminds us of just how important our role is 
um, it says there, you know, the important role for the practitioners to determine what the young child could learn through their own interests, balanced with obviously the areas of the curriculum that we need to get through. And this is about supporting a high quality learning environment with high quality interactions to enable children to support and extend their own learning, to deepen their thinking and for them to make progress. Um, and then this leads me back to my earlier point, you know, about the classroom setup, you know, how important obviously the nurturing environment is, but these spaces and these, these experiences that you set up for the children will ultimately lead to these high quality interactions that you can have with them because this is it's these interactions, it's these observations, it's these questions that are crucial for us as class teachers to assess and really challenge and extend the learning further for that child. Um, the photo there on the left hand side is of a little girl who had shown an interest in our number stones and she had ordered the number stones all the way up to 20 but she was struggling a, struggling a little bit with the numbers after 30 but I had noticed this and I observed this and I went over and I questioned to find out what she was trying to do and then together we thought about you know how the numbers are repeated so that supported our input in the numbers into order up to 30 but then I challenged her further by thinking about what the numbers look like with the Numicon and she really enjoyed this experience. So we started obviously at the beginning at one and then we built up and we built up. And by the time we got to 18, 19, she had really grasped the concept of that place value. And then from not being able to put the numbers into order, from 20 to 30, she was already then able to put out the Numicon that showed the value of that number. And that was maybe a five, 10 minute experience for that child. But because it was out there, she had led it, she shown an interest in the stones. My job was then to observe it, to know when to interact, to use what we would call on the spot teaching or teaching in the moment to really question and understand what it was that she was trying to do and then think about how I could challenge and extend that learning further to get a really quality interaction and learning experience from it. And then the photograph on the right there um, is just the epitome of loose parts. I mean, I love loose parts and loose parts in a play-based environment should be all around the room and in most of your areas, if not all of your areas. Um, these two children here were in the home corner and they had taken these loose parts, which are corks, um, little wooden um, men things, um, lids and bottle tops, and they had created a wedding cake. And we then talked about tiers, what a tier of a wedding cake is, and the traditional uses of what wedding cakes represent, or the tiers represent, and we talked about, you know, icing and all, all different things, and why we have cakes at weddings, and when else do we have cakes, and what do they look like? So, yeah, it's just, I, my role has changed so much, and the children lead my role, if you like, and I just absolutely love it. There's another quote there at the bottom, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in my next slide, you know, the importance that practitioners and teachers provide through responsive and intentional planning, you know, a blend of child-initiated and adult-initiated learning experiences, and the emphasis should be on the child-centred play pedagogy to continue the children's curriculum experience. So how do I do this? How do I make this work for me? So on a daily basis, my children will actually play for, for large parts of the day. And this is what we would call the child initiated learning because the children are going out into the spaces and they're interacting with the activities that I've perhaps put out or that they have led because of something I've observed the previous day or even the previous hour. And these are the activities which, you know, enable children to investigate and engage with things that have purpose and meaning to them. This is planned purposeful learning, which is, you know, children actively engage, it's opportunistic, it's pleasurable, it's creative, 
and it's, compo it's concerned more with the means than the end. Um, this can really foster spontaneous play, child-led play, child-initiated learning can really foster spontaneous play and child-led learning is determined as actually the most beneficial to a children's social, emotional and development. And it's during these playtimes, as I've talked about in my previous slide, that I use a toolkit of things to really support the learning that's taking place, but also which will inform then my teacher-initiated or directed learning. Next, you know, that part that it said about, you know, responsive and intentional planning, that part with the little girl on the previous slide where I was talking about, you know, working with the number stones, that was probably more of a responsive planning approach. Whereas, you know, the intentional on the, the picture of the children on, you know, the right hand side who had built the, the tiered wedding cake, you know, an intentional planning from that would maybe come from, let's get out some recipe books, let's look at other cakes, how do we make other cakes and so on. But these, you know, the, the teacher initiated and the directed learning are activities that arise from the teacher's planning as I say, which is linked to the observations and the interactions that the, the class teacher has with the children during their play. Um, sometimes, obviously, you know, this happens almost immediately like it did with the little girl in the, the number stones. Sometimes it happens a short while after where I would facilitate a provocation or I would change a resource or a space in relation to what I had observed. But ultimately, it is the children's interests that drive most of the change that is seen in the learning environment and that is shown to be the most beneficial to their academic development as if you've taken on board the children's interests and letting that drive the changes that happen. And then finally, you know, I, I use teacher directed learning as well and that's probably um, more from intensive activity from my planning. That's the things that I think, you know, need to be taught. So that's more direct and the focus is more on the teacher's time supporting individuals learning. So things like, you know, phonics, for example, I still have a slot for phonics. I still teach, you know, reading skills and things like that. So there are moments where I, you know, or times throughout the day where I'll have the children gathered either in groups or individually or in a, as a class and do some teacher directed learning. But even still, the teacher-directed learning often comes from something that I have observed in the play initiated by the children that lots of children have been interested in. Like, for example, if we go right back to that slide I showed you about with the boys in the volcano, um, we actually ended up doing a week's worth of, you know, work with the whole class because they were all so interested in finding out what the boys had been doing and we shared that at a carpet time and then that led on to the whole class then doing a little bit of learning around volcanoes and that would be your more intentional teacher directed learning. Um, yeah, and then obviously during these times when the children are facilitating their own learning is when, you know, I do my observations and I use higher order question on the spot teaching to meet the individual needs or the teaching in the moment like I've talked about. But this sheet on the right here is the recording sheet that I use and I use that to really analyse the learning that's occurred and then I match that to the experiences and outcomes or the benchmarks in the early level. One of the biggest impacts for me in assessing in this way is that the children actually cover, which I said previously in my presentation, that the children cover more E's and O's in a day through play than I would ever have planned for them even in a week or a month of if I was really leading the learning and that really astounded me and what's more is that because they can experience it over and over again the children in these ex in these spaces the learning actually becomes deeper and more embedded each time they do it. And in the following few slides, I'm just going to show you a few more examples of just how this works. So my classroom throughout my whole play journey since I began has had a set of blocks in them, wooden blocks. And I read somewhere once actually that the whole of the early level curriculum can actually be taught through block play. And I actually agree with that. 
All the children in my room use the blocks and the experience is enhanced through the loose parts which are placed next to them. The boys in this picture had recreated a building from Minecraft, an online computer game, and it was fascinating to hear them share this experience with me and each other. They were so proud of this structure and we uploaded it onto their seesaw so that they could share that with their parents too. Around the slide you can see just how many things were covered in this one experience and yet the next day they'll probably build something entirely different and deepen their learning even further than what they did that they on the things they'd achieved that day, but also enhance and develop with even more learning, especially when they build with other children or use loose parts and the blocks in a completely different way the next day. But you'll see we've hit um, maths experiences and outcomes, science experiences and outcomes, social subjects, and then there's things in the literacy around creating texts and tools for listening and talking between them. It's quite fascinating actually. There are so many examples that I could share with you. However, I want to finish with this example before I draw to my conclusion. This is Cupcake Munch. Um, was a cafe that these children had created in one of the social spaces in the room. They used loose parts to create the many different cupcakes that they had made. However, with some intentional planning from this child-led learning, the girls created their very own company called Cupcake Munch. This cafe was then created in a different part of the room and the girls collected and organised all the things that they needed to make it successful and it ran as a play experience in the room for a good few weeks. They then involved other children and we made signs and menus and price lists. We had a chef, waiters, waitresses, customers. We explored and used money and we became extremely creative in our cupcake inventions and designs with the loose parts. The child initiated learning was then challenged and extended by the class teacher, myself and the children and then facilitated with some responsive and intentional planning on my part um, and with my conversations with these children. And you can see in, in the list on the right hand side that this experience, which was led by them, facilitated by me, hit E's and O's in a huge list of subjects for not just these children but for the entire class over the experience over the time that that experience ran for. So Stuart and Pugh define pedagogy as the understanding of how children learn and develop and the practices through which we can enhance that process. So I hope in listening to me today you've come to realise that play is the best way for children to learn because it's what drives them intrinsically to engage with the world around them. Understanding why play is developmentally important for children will enable us as practitioners to think more deeply about how we can use play to enhance and develop the child further. And in addition, we can do this by becoming more skilled in our interactions with the children, becoming more skilled in observing them in play and better understanding the learning that is happening. And finally, we can become skilled in using this child-led learning to facilitate and drive the cur curriculum that we think best suits our learners. So the nurturing and physical environment plus the children plus skilled practitioners equals learning. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please feel free to get in touch with me should you want to chat about things further. I've popped my email address there at the bottom. Thanks again.